The panelists uh, we have uh, were selected because they are the trial lawyers around the country who have tried the most jury patent cases in the last four or five years. And we have with us, us today uh, Bill Lee of Wilmer uh, Hale, uh, John Desmaris of Desmaris LLP, uh, Doug Cawley of McCool Smith, and Juanita Brooks of Fish and Richardson. And let me begin uh, in these, we've all heard a lot today, uh, and let me begin by putting to Doug the, this question. Uh, apart from the Seventh Amendment, Doug, do you think that jurors are the most effective way to decide patent disputes, and why? Well, that's a good question, and I should hope so, because I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> you know, this, this, this question about our attitude collectively and the public's attitude to the role of jury and patent cases is far from academic. I can report to you that every day in district courts around the country, federal judges make important decisions largely influenced in many cases by their attitude about the propriety of jury decisions in patent cases. You have judges who believe that juries usually get it right those judges, by and large, tend to be conservative about motions to dismiss, motions on Daubert, motions for summary judgment, and JMOL. On the other hand, you have some federal judges who are frankly skeptical uh, about the capability of jurors handling the legal and factual issues that are presented in patent cases. And those judges tend to be more assertive about using those procedural tools to move the decision from being jury-centric to being more judge-centric. <clears throat> but patent litigation, as we have heard, like all kinds of litigation, but particularly patent litigation, is like a big sieve. Most of the potential cases out there never get filed because a lawyer realizes from brief examination of it that you can't plausibly make an assertion. Of the cases that do get filed, most of them go out on settlement. We saw that this morning. Most of the rest go out on motion to dismiss or a fatal Daubert decision or a JMOL or a motion for summary judgment. And we saw the statistic this morning that only 1% of cases ever go to a jury trial. And I don't think that statistic accounted for the fact that some of that 1% will be poured out by the district judge on JMOL and certainly by the federal circuit on an appellate decision. So that means that the true number of patent cases that are dispositively decided by juries is a fraction of 1%. Now, what does that mean practically? Practically, that yields the dirty secret of patent litigation, and it is this. Most cases that are sent to the jury in patent litigation and, and the jury makes a dispositive decision are cases in which it is impossible to determine who is right. The cases where it was clear who was right, those went out on summary judgment. Those go out on JMOL. Those get decided by the federal circuit. What's left for dispositive jury decisions are cases where you can't say who is, quote, right. We have to make a decision, but we don't know who's, quote, right. And let's do a brief experiment to illustrate that. You've got a patent case. You've got clients on both sides who genuinely believe they're right on the merits. You've got lawyers who craft the case, if they're good lawyers, so that they believe they are right in their assertions. They have hired experts 
who admittedly are, are hired guns, but the lawyers and the experts have worked together to make sure that the experts are only going to ask to opine on issues that they genuinely believe are right. The jury decides there's infringement because that's the only issue in this imaginary case. The trial judge agrees and denies JMOL. The federal circuit reverses, but there's a dissent. So two judges at the federal circuit think there's substantial evidence or there's not substantial evidence, no infringement. One says, yeah, there's substantial evidence. How did that case come out? How was it decided? Well, obviously, the defendant won. But who was right? You've got four judges who looked at the issue, and they're split two to two. You've got the experts who are split, the lawyers who are split, the clients who are split. We've spent millions of dollars and years of effort by very talented people, and we don't know who's right. That then presents what I think is the critical question on this issue. If we have to have a mechanism in our society to decide disputes where we can't definitively say who is right, but we still have to decide what voices do we want to participate in deciding issues like that give you an example that we saw this morning. When Professor Lemley's statistics all flashed by, one that I happened to notice was that in medical cases, the plaintiff patent holder wins 12% more often than in electronics cases. Now, we don't actually know why that is, but I'm going to take a guess. I'm going to guess it's because average people think that innovators in medicine are more deserving of protection than people who come up with a new app for a smartphone. If that's true, do we want that voice to participate in the decision-making process? And I say, of course we do. Uh, Juanita, can you think, of, apart from the Seventh Amendment, uh, why would a jury be better at deciding issues in a patent case than three judges or three experts? Or so I, one of my Bibles is a uh, talk that was given by Judge Rifkin in 1954. No, I was not there. Um, <laughs> And it's called the, the Romance Discoverable in Patent Cases. And he gave it to uh, a bar association in the Southern District of New York. And he talked about a patent case being no different than any other case as far as someone in the case wears the white hat, someone in the case wears the black hat, someone in the case is right, someone in the case is wrong. And that essentially, in order to prevail and win your case and win your point, you have to have all three components of what the great philosophers used to have, ethos, pathos, and logos. You must be able to connect with the determiner, be it a judge or a jury, on an emotional level. You have to have the emotional hook that your opponent doesn't have. You have to have, on an ethical level, you have to have the moral high ground. And you have to have a logical case. It can't be purely an emotional appeal. And I believe that jurors are better able to parse that out and discuss amongst themselves and come to one mind than um, one, one person or, or frankly, even, even three. Um, but that being said, when we've had discussions internally about do we want to potentially waive jury in this case, the answer is always no, because if we have a case where it's legally appealing, where only a 112 defense, for example, that the, their, the patent lacks written description, there's a barn burner for a jury to decide, and they, of course, have the prejudice that, well, the examiner would have picked that up, and so who are we to second guess the examiner, if, in fact, we're unsuccessful with the jury, but we are correct 
that the patent lacks written description, the judge can fix that on JMAL. So why would we give up basically getting two bites of the apple, which is to first try to convince the jury of that, but if we're unsuccessful, to have the stopgap of the JMAL? Is, uh, have you ever heard, has anyone ever heard of a, uh, a patent case on the plaintiff's side that's not done on a contingent fee basis? <laughs> Yeah, and doesn't that tell us something, folks? Actually, we tried the Apple case on a non-contingent fee basis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but usually these are contingent fee cases. And uh, aren't they usually fit in the mold, David versus Goliath, the little guy, the inventor versus the big guy? It's typically why you want a jury, because the jury is going to favor your client. I mean, isn't that part of what's going on here, and that makes it different than other kinds of litigation. Didn't, uh, didn't we see we, in Mark's comments that that wasn't necessarily true? Yeah, I, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you don't. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, in a certain set of circumstances, it's possibly true that that would be something that would favor a jury, but for me, there is, I mean, when the, the judges are up here, there's a certain humility of judges who've seen the cases that get decided, and they realize, one, they're just human beings, too, that they have their own biases and their views, and in some sense, having them decide the case is like having a jury of one. And I think probably what the four of us collectively think is there's a wisdom to the craft of eight, ten, twelve people being their collective judgment of what's fair, um, and deciding the issue. And if you think through some of the issues <laughs> talked about today, should we have people who are specialized? Well, then the question for me would be specialized in what? I mean, today, some of the damages issues are much harder than some of the underlying technical issues. Um, by bringing a jury to bear, they bring their common sense, their collective judgment, and they basically can make the type of determinations John was talking about, which are credibility determinations, common sense determinations. Sometimes they benefit the little guy against the big guy, but not all the time, as Mark particularly said. I mean, if you think about why we have a Seventh Amendment in the first place, it's because the, found, the founding fathers who were from the South thought that the juries would favor debtors over creditors. I mean, the scholarship on that is clear. I mean, it was Wall, Main Street versus Wall Street back in 1791. So why should it be any different today? I mean, why don't we just acknowledge that juries are good for the little guy uh, and hold corporate America to a higher standard? Isn't that being honest, in fact? But, but I, think, I think Mark's statistics put the lie to that, right? I mean, the inventors are not doing as well as as the other type of plaintiffs we see in the statistics. So, I mean, but I, I mean, my gut reaction is the same as yours. If I'm representing an individual patent plaintiff, uh, I would always go for a jury because I have in my mind the big guy versus little guy and the David versus Goliath. But so I was actually a little bit surprised by Mark's statistics on that. But I'm not doing as well as other But, but I do agree with you that if, if uh, you know, if I'm representing a solo practitioner, uh, you know, an individual patent plaintiff, I would almost, almost always choose a jury. The expense of a jury trial is uh, uh, dug largely uh, a consequence of the length of the trial. I mean, if you just limited all trials, jury trials, to five days, uh, you would largely reduce the expense, you would get higher quality jurors, uh, and it doesn't seem to affect the outcome according to Mark's research. Uh, have you ever felt you were disadvantaged by having too little time to put on your case? When I ran out of time, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, at, I was at a seminar in California about uh, two years ago and I had tried a case uh, against uh, one of the lawyers at Tecker Van Ness in California, a really good trial lawyer, Bob Van Ness, and he and I had, had gone head to head and 
we got a very tight time limit before Judge Leonard Davis in Tyler, Texas. And Bob Duff was going on and on and on before this collection. This is this is the educational event before the the uh, for federal judges, and he was going on and on and on about how unfair this case. He'd been in Texas, and he was only given two hours to present his willfulness case. And I said, after he finished, I said, Bob, can you remind me who won that issue? Because of course he did, despite the fact that he only had two hours. You know, my attitude about time limits is the longest movie you ever saw was probably no more than three hours long. Seven hours is Lord of the Rings territory, all episodes, okay? And if you're given 13 hours aside to try your patent case, which, which Judge Gilstrap, do you give anybody 13 hours aside these days? Occasionally, okay. That's a whole season of the Game of Thrones, for crying out loud. Now, what is it about our activity that's so special that they can do it and we can't? Well, you'll start hearing people talk about, well, there's rules of procedure have to put on different ways. I think that's all a load of it. The reason is because those people know how to communicate and they spend hours and hours and hours refining their presentation until they get it exactly right and we don't. So I think it's it's nothing but positive for everything to have reasonable tight time limits. And Steve can I just give one example where it can backfire. Um, and, and I couldn't agree more with Doug, by the way. You know, Mark Twain, the infamous saying, if I'd had more time, I would have written a shorter story. And it does take a lot of effort to hone it down, but it certainly benefits the jury tremendously, and it benefits your case. Um, there's two things, though, that have been said that a, a personal experience I would disagree with. One is, for example, that, that jury trials are necessarily more expensive than bench trials. And that isn't necessarily true at all. The, the, the preparation that has to go into a bench trial is as much as it is for a jury trial. And even if you have a bench trial where you show up for two hours on one day and then three hours the following week and then two hours the following week, that's actually even more expensive because behind you, not in court, are your paralegals and your graphic artists and your support staff who have to then move in and out and in and out of a war room and the cost become almost astronomical if we, if we do it that way. Um, so I just wanted to just share that personal experience. The second, as far as time limits, the only time that uh, I felt that we've been disadvantaged with time limits was as the defendant where we held our, so, so we, what you do is you budget before the trial starts. And you say, okay, this is how much time everybody has for each cross-examination, each direct examination, opening, closing, and so on. And you, keep like five hours in the bank because someone always goes over and you try to get them to sit down and you can't. And so you've done it. Now you're the defendant and the plaintiff hasn't done it properly and now they're in the defense case and they need more time. And they've asked successfully in two of my cases, asked the judge to give them more time. And the judge has and said, don't worry, I'm gonna give you the equal amount of time. And our point was, but we would have used that on cross-examination last week if we'd had that time. And so there, we, we really were at the disadvantage as the defense when it, if the judge doesn't stick to hard time limits. There, there's another interesting thing about time limits, though, um, which is if they're too short, especially for a defendant, you are forced to really just pick one defense. And, you know, hopefully you pick the good one. But you do have to leave meritorious defenses on the cutting room floor, and that's a, it's a tough thing to do to your client to say, okay, we have a great defense of this, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna leave that on the cutting room floor. And I, I agree that it's probably if you pick the best defense, you'll probably be fine in the long run. But it's, it is a tough business. Bill, do you think it's more expensive to try a jury case than a bench case? Uh, I actually I agree with what in my experience has been just as hurt. I mean, I think if you try a bench case in four days, right, and it's all continuous, it's probably pretty close to the same cost because you have to get ready, you have the same investment. Discovery is the same. Discovery is the same. Your evidence ought to be the same. In fact, it's more, there's as much post-trial briefing, right, because of the post findings. I think the 
bigger problem because you know, kids are busy. They have other things to do. And sometimes the easiest thing to do is to suspend the trial for a day, come back the next week. And my experience is when you come back in a week, what you do is you spend half the day retrying what you did right. the last half day. And a four-day trial becomes an eight-day trial at the end. And so I actually you know, we tell our clients that often the jury waiting case is more expensive than so the jury. Why has the trial bar been so ineffective in informing the consuming public, corporations, that it's just as cheap to try a jury case as it is a bench case? Why have we fallen down? If all y'all agree, what's the problem here? I actually think it may go back to your first question you asked John and me, which is the inherent bias that simply because there is an individual plaintiff suing a major corporation before a jury, it's game over. Um, you know, we do much more work on the defendant's side than we do on the plaintiff's side, and it's not game over. Um, and there's a lot that can be done, and I would tell you that if I'm at the same place Juanita is, which is even if I'm the defendant against an individual inventor, I'm presumptively good with the jury, which is I think is very important. Now, there may be some things that would drive you to a different conclusion if you had a jury, but you usually don't. But I presumptively would rather have eight folks at the start than just one. But to answer your question, Steve, I think we need more seminars like this. I think the media me, is the one that just says that, oh, yeah. these poor plaintiffs, they can't get their day in court because it's so ridiculously expensive when you go to a jury. And if we just had a judge make the determination, it wouldn't be. Uh, and it, I think it's a myth that's just gotten perpetuated. So uh, there is one expense uh, on jury trials that is not duplicated in a bench trial, and that is the time we spend arguing about uh, motions and limiting, what screening what the jury will hear uh, in arguing about that, which is not so important in a bench trial. Um, my question to you, Juanita, is does it make any difference I mean, suppose, can you think of a case where if the judge has said, I deny all motions in limine, I let the jury hear everything, it would make a difference in the outcome? I, I do. And I think it was referred to earlier that one of the problems with a bench trial is that the judge hears things that he or she shouldn't hear as the trier of fact, but hears them because they're the court. And it's ridiculous to bring a motion in limine in a bench trial to tell the judge, now you're not to hear the following things. And then the judge hears the following things. Um, like what? <laughs> like, like what? Uh, like, for example, um, that there's previous litigation between the parties. There's bad blood between the parties. Um, Bill very successfully milled out my best oh. defense in one of our cases we had against each other, which is his client tried a hostile takeover of my client, and well, it didn't second. succeed. <laughs> wait a <laughs> second. Right. <laughs> Do I'll you give think you that, Bill. If, we, if we rely on juries to bring common sense and perception to the table, why do we try to keep so much evidence from them? For example, Judge Gilstrap said that uh, the people who use phones, mobile phones, should have a seat at the table in a mobile phone infringement case. And yet, I bet he would grant a motion in limine that I file as a plaintiff trying to prevent a defendant from arguing to the jury that if you let the plaintiff recover, the price of the mobile phone is going to go up. Okay? So, hello. I mean, on the one hand, we want them to have a place at the table, but on the other hand, we won't let the lawyers tell them the truth. Does that make any sense? Well, I mean, if the truth is going to make, it's going to drive their decision on a basis that's not a merits basis on what they're considering, and I think, yeah, we got to keep that stuff out. Like, for instance, you know, Bill does a lot of work for Apple. Is it, is it relevant at an Apple trial that, you know, they're in tax trouble, or is it, you know, in, in Ireland? You know, it's not relevant to the dispute they're deciding, and that could sway a juror one way or another because maybe they think, you know, Apple should pay more taxes, but, like, it's not relevant to the dispute. So those sorts of peripheral issues that are emotional to regular people, I think definitely should be kept out. And uh, Steve, to answer your other question about how can we hold down the costs of motions in limine, 
to the court. Uh, Judge Stark, for example, has a three motion in limine rule. That's it. And so we. <laughs> and what if they, the fourth one's really meritorious? It's really meritorious, <laughs> and I know, but but and and they, it causes us to really then both parties to really hone in on okay, what are the crit critical 403 issues here? Not not just every you know not a motion in limine to prevent the other side from showing up, but and putting on a case. But what are absolute clear four at least in your mind clear 403 issues? So that's one way to to kind of cabin it. Yeah, and I think they can perform a useful function. I mean, Judge Connolly, I don't think had a limit, but had a, a whole series of MILs that got decided before trial started. But then once the trial started, it meant no sidebar, right? No, mm -hmm. not too many objections. And the jury's time could be more efficient. So I think, you know, having them both focus on what they should focus on, not have them focus on it, as John says, might be morally persuasive, but probably analytically irrelevant, right? And then there's just an efficiency uh, to it that allows it to go quickly. I know Judge Gilstep does the same. Those are all decided at the beginning, and that's it. And you better live by them or there's going to be trouble. Um, and that just makes the whole proceeding go quicker. Uh, a lot of time is spent, Juanita, uh, are talking about the burden of proof in contempt cases difference between preponderance of the evidence and uh, clear and convincing evidence. Uh, do you think that makes any difference in how the jury decides? Well, I'm t I don't know if Judge Young is still here. Until I saw his hands, I was hoping not so much, but um, that's, a, that's a little scary. Um, actually, it, it's interesting. So in, I, in my first life, I did criminal defense, and there, relying on proof beyond a reasonable doubt was critical. As, as the defense. But when you start to get more nuanced, the difference between preponderance and clear and convincing, um, yes, judges will say, well, it's you know, more likely than not. Well, if you're talking about non-infringement, that's also then a very small burden for the defendant. Is it more likely than not we don't infringe? And so I, I think it doesn't necessarily help or hurt either side. We, we argued to a jury that the judge had used a football analogy to sh talk about preponderance and said all they have to do is get it over the 50-yard line. And so we said they're still in the locker room. And the jury understood that then and, and agreed with us. Clear and convincing, some judges will allow a litigant to argue, the plaintiff to argue it is the same standard that the state uses, they have to meet before they can take away your child. And, uh, sorry, <laughs> just thinking about my patent baby. And so, <laughs> jurors become like, oh my God, that's a really, really high standard. Um, on the other hand, we own it as plaintiffs. Then. I, we say, I, I mean as defendants, and we say, well, we've met it and then some. So. The, the answer is, I think, good lawyers try to, to make that sort of not an issue. But I think a bigger issue, though, is just an inherent belief by every juror walking in that a patent examiner did his or her job and would not have issued that patent. I think Judge Stark referred to it as a, you know, a government-given property right. And, and that, I think, is a bigger hurdle for, for defendants to have to overcome. I did, I did uh, see a case once, I didn't do this myself, I'm sorry to say, but the uh, lawyer came in to the closing with a ream of paper, 500 sheets, and he put a file here and said, that's 250 sheets of paper. That's 250 sheets of paper. He took one sheet off and moved it over and said, that's a preponderance of the evidence. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I actually... <laughs> so... Actually, I was getting ready for a trial before Judge Gilstrap in a mo recently where one of the motions limine by the defendant was to prevent me from referring to the burden of proof any other way than the language in the instructions. In other words, I couldn't do the paper thing. I couldn't do Judge Young's thing. I couldn't say about taking away my child as an example of what clear and convincing evidence is. And, I mean, that was a seriously briefed issue. And uh, we get this in a, lo a lot of patent cases, spend a lot of time. Would it not make sense for the patent bar on both sides to try to come up with, 
like a green motion is limited. What can you say? The patent office making a mistake. That's a bit. How far can you go beyond the movie? Can you embellish on it beyond the movie? What can you say about a non-practicing entity? You know, what? How, how can you call them? Uh, can't we eliminate some of these time-consuming, expensive elements of a jury trial in a patent case by just all agreeing, here are the rules, and encouraging the judges to adopt these? I have a, Bill, funny, I have a funny motion and limiting story. I, I think I'm, I will let yeah. John answer. No, I, I wasn't <laughs> going to answer that. I was actually going to tell a funny motion and limiting story. I was, in a, I was in a jurisdiction one time uh, that was not all that favorable to New Yorkers, and the uh, my adversary was local and, and playing that up through all the pretrial. So we actually made a motion in limity to prevent him from telling the jury that I was from New York. And uh, it was it turned out to be a very long oral argument, but we won the motion in limity. And the next day at jury selection, the judge introduced me as John Damaris from New York City. <laughs> <laughs> so the next time I got to change a motion in limity, is it to prevent the court and the other yeah, side from yeah. saying I'm from New York? Good luck on that. <laughs> Yeah, I think the answer to you is it's a laudable goal, but I think it's probably a quixotic goal. I mean, judges have different perspectives and different views on this, and we deal with them differently. Each case presents a different set of facts that might result in some things in that regard. Um, I think what you can do is, you know, many of the judges like the judges we have on the panel today have other cases. So you can get the drift of what they're going to do, and we can all probably save some money and do ourselves a service by just agreeing to what we know they're going to do, and then just use Judge Stark's plea bring things that are case unique. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you can do that. I mean, Doug and I are more frequently on the other side of the case from the judges than we are on the same side. But we're able to agree upon most things without a lot of excess costs and churn. And then we can focus on what's important. And, you know, Steve, I, might, I can't resist just pitching in there on that subject. In the midst of the fervent debate on venue reform and patent litigation, here you have an example of four practitioners who were very familiar with the procedures in Delaware, and, and many with Judge Stark's procedure. We just heard about his motions in limine. Who were very familiar with Judge Gilstrap's procedures, that there is an incredible efficiency and cost savings from litigating before judges that you have a high degree of predictability about how they're going to rule. If you had a patent infringement case, uh, would you always file it in the Eastern District of Texas? <coughs> no. Why not? Well, <coughs> for one thing, uh, you say if you could. I mean, I assume that means you, you have a high degree you're going to survive yeah. uh, transfer. Right. Uh, you know, different. different uh, if, if you have a pharmaceutical case, you'd have to seriously consider New Jersey because they do that a lot. If you have another kind of case, you might consider Delaware, Central California. Uh, you're going to want to know something about the jury pool in those places and how it relates to the issues that you're going to be trying. So, no, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that you'd always file in the Eastern District of Texas. Yeah. I, I actually think that where you file is the combination of at least four things. It's the strength of your case, it's the strength of your narrative, relief you're asking for, and it's your time in the circuit. Do that again. The strength, so I, the strength of your case on the analytical and legal element, the strength of your narrative, which can overlap, but can be completely independent. Um, it's the relief you're requesting, and it's your time in the circuit. So, for instance, um, if you had, if you needed injunctive relief to stop someone from importing and using it, but you couldn't, right? You actually might go to the ITC the day before you went to everywhere, anywhere else. The ITC is up like 60% in most cases this year because they're not staying cases when IPRs are instituted. And they're issuing exclusion orders when district courts get them. Right? So that would tell you to go there. I think Doug's right. If you had a Hatch-Waxman case that was a jury waived case, you'd probably go to Delaware or New Jersey where they have a lot of experience with the cases. Yeah. If you had your case, you'd probably go to do it again. Uh, where would you go to Delaware? I, Delaware and New Jersey just have an enormous amount of experience with the hatch wax and life science. These are not jury cases. They, they can be not jury cases, but when someone launches the risk, they, they can become jury cases. Then I asked the wrong question. Mm -hmm. 
the question should be, you have a case that has 100% on the rightfulness of your case, 100% on the narrative, okay, and you need damages. Where would you go? All things being equal, what you just told me, I'd go to the Eastern District of Texas. And Bill? I, I, I think that's correct, but then I think um, Judge Gilstrap once told me about it, like his first 25 cases, and there were like half plaintiff, I think, half defendant, and one verdict over $25 million. So a question would be if you're looking for your big numbers, is that the right jurisdiction or not? And I don't think you can be 100% sure. No, of course not. Where would you go? Well, there are, there, so there's another factor that hasn't been mentioned yet, which is if you are representing a local company, um, for example, Bill, um, who was looking for some big numbers, was representing Broadcom and filed in Orange County. Um, that, that was the case I was talking about when he motioned. You can see I'm still really happy about that case. Um, <laughs> I'll let that one go. Years I'll ago. get over that. <laughs> I'm in therapy. Um, so, you know, you drove off the freeway in Orange County, all the jurors did, and there was Broadcom. Everywhere you looked was the Broadcom sign. And my client, and this was little guy versus big guy. It didn't help to be, we were behind the Ikea store, um, so you couldn't even find us. But So if you're looking for like local loyalty, a company that is well respected in a particular uh, area or a, an academic institution, for example, you might want to go there to get that, that local connection. Um, and just to show you, again, just different experiences, uh, Micron was actually the first firm to file a Hatch-Waxman case in the Eastern District of Texas. And the reason that we did is we had litigated the molecule already in Delaware as a, as a new chemical entity, and we had protected those patents and we had won. But just like we had talked about where if a judge sees someone claiming that they invented the Internet the first time, they might say, oh, but if they see them, someone claiming they've invented the internet is the 15th time, they'd be a little more skeptical. So we thought we shouldn't bring the reformulation of that molecule back to Delaware. Um, and Judge Ward was still sitting on the bench, and I previous experience with him, knew that he was incredibly bright and unbelievably hard worker and very, he had actually worked in the drug industry before taking the bench. And so we thought this is a perfect judge to hear this case as both the judge and the trier of fact. And in fact, we were successful, and he was upheld at the Fed Circuit, no problem, on, a, on what would normally be a little bit shaky formulation patent. Uh, John, would you, um, uh, would you ever consent to a, some sort of specialized group where you can see mm -hmm. or agree to that of some kind of case? It would be a very special circumstance. I could see doing that probably only in the situation where I was on the defense for a big company and I felt we were very clearly, demonstrably right on the technology and that um, then I might conclude that I might be safer if I had a specialized jury on that technology. But I, other than that circumstance, I'm not sure. You know, a lot of these cases, it, that's a difficult thing to, to make a choice. You better be darn sure you're right on the technology. You know? Have any of you ever heard of a judge in a jury trial hot tubbing experts? Call in at the same time. Well, let me ask this. Requiring that parties call their experts back to back so that the jury can compare the expert testimony. Yeah, I, I've never had a judge require that, but as a defendant, we have sometimes called, when the plaintiff is called as their last witness, as their damages expert, and we think that it's a shaky damages claim, we have sometimes done the counterintuitive and led a tar case with our damages expert. Now it's high risk, high reward, and you have to be pretty sure that you've got the higher ground. But the two times we've done it, we really wanted to put a side by side those two. And I, I think with the, those two, it has to work okay. What would your objection be to a judge's telling you 
telling the parties that you have to call your expert back to back. I, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I, I, would do, I would be in favor of that. Doug? Well, I've had that happen uh, for convenience sake. Uh, a defendant expert who had an immovable conflict and the judge allowed the defendant or allowed the defendant to put them on after our expert. And I have to say I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't object to it because I think it favors the plaintiff. I think that uh, if it's in the middle of the plaintiff's case, it's only expert testimony. It's not a compelling fact witness. You have the chance to cross-examine them. Uh, I think all, all things considered, if I, was, if I was on the defense side of the case, which I sometimes am, I wouldn't do it. Juanita? I would actually d disagree with Doug on this one. I would want to do it as the defense. I would want, because sometimes we try, so John and I had yeah. a case where we didn't get to put our experts on until like, what, three weeks, I think, into the trial. And by then, you know, the jury, all they remembered is that we infringed, we infringed, we infringed. And now, finally, the three weeks later, we go, no, we don't. And now we're going to tell you how we don't infringe. And um, while we were successful on some of the, the patents, we weren't successful on all of them. And I think if we had been able to do it back to back, we might have been successful even on all of them. Yeah, I, mean, I totally agree. If I was a defendant, I would definitely want to do that. So this at least is an innovation that we might get bipartisan support <laughs> from. <laughs> you judges out there, listen. Well, you know, they How do something like that with lawyers. In, in, uh, in Northern District of California, several times I've had arguments where if the other side says something or I say something and it's key to the dispute, the judge will stop uh, the argument and say, okay, wait right there and call the other guy up to the podium and say, respond to that, respond to that, respond to that. And they're doing it with the lawyers. And I think that really helps the argument crystallize for the judge. And, then, and this would, experts would do the same thing. Some judges, a few judges around the country have suggested that uh, they make the lawyers give their opening statement or opening argument before voir dire. Uh, in other words, you're going to have to make an opening statement on Tuesday morning. You might as well make it Monday afternoon with the entire jury array there. And then after open, it's not repeated again once the eight jurors are seated, but you make it then. What do you think of that idea? As, as a means of uh, making jury selection more interesting for those who are not selected, uh, as a means of having a better voir dire. Uh, I had a, a judge in Phoenix had us do that. Not quite that. She said, um, give a mini opening to the whole veneer to try to entice them to want to serve because in this judge's experience, everybody wanted out of the patent cases and she was having a hard time impaneling them. So she said, you know, do something interesting, I'll give you 10 minutes, and then we'll pick the jury. And that was actually quite effective at getting people interested. Anyone else have any reaction? Well, we redid the opening, though, was the real thing. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure that, it, it, it clearly could interest some folks, but I'm not sure it's going to save you much time. <laughs> and then I worry a little bit about the cases where it's harder to pick the jury and it happens over a couple of days and people are sitting in a room you know, waiting to be called in and they sit at the sidebar and they start talking about the opening before they're even in panel. That's not what you want to have happen. Judge Meyer. Um, I want to take a moment uh, to mention something because this panel and the prior panel uh, mentioned the burden on uh, the system that the cost and the time that civil litigation takes. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm a senior trial judge in Washington, D.C., and serve as a fellow at the National Center for State Courts. And I think it would be uh, important for all of you to appreciate and know that two months ago, the Conference of Chief Justices, the Chief Justice of every state Supreme Court in conference, uh, an institution that's been around for over 50 years. They resolved unanimously three years ago to create a special committee of the conference to deal with the cost and the time it takes to get a civil judgment. 
And we're not just talking about um, complex litigation, but the whole book of civil business from small claims to uh, professional malpractice, uh, those, everything. And so this special committee, uh, which was not only chief justices, but uh, trial judges, court administrators, experienced trial lawyers from plaintiff and defense side, uh, researchers. For two years they met, gathered evidence, and their, com their commission was, where have best practices been tried in pilot projects around the country? Let's examine them, let's uh, evaluate them, and report back to the full conference uh, what we think are best practices that have been employed by courts around the country. And there was a federal judge who was a liaison to, the, to this special committee, uh, Rick Story from Georgia. Um, so, two months ago, the full conference received the recommendations. There are 13 of them. They unanimously adopted them. And now phase two begins of implementing these in states around the country whose chief and Supreme Court say this is something we've got to do. And um, I just want to highlight a couple of things because I think they relate to things we've been talking about here. Thirteen recommendations based on pilot project analysis. Some of the highlights are that judges have to take on more case management responsibility. They cannot leave it to the lawyers to uh, decide when things are going to be done. Time management, very important. Team management, very important. Cases have to be triaged on the time of filing. And besides filing the complaint, lawyers or the filer has to indicate the complexity of the case in their estimation, what they rely on in terms of a claim. If it's a contract, the contract has to be identified, those kinds of things. Trial management, there's an appendix to the report where model trial management practices are encouraged to trial judges. And I might say, you might find this interesting, Steve, that uh, an article you and Tom Melsheimer wrote about time management is something that's cited in that best practices. Technology, use of technology, uh, has to be more uh, fully embraced so that cases are have plenty of ticklers for judges and lawyers that time limits are being met. If they've been missed, the judge has to know about it. <clears throat> Excuse me, another, in the, another thing, it even gets down to, and this is something that one of you panelists mentioned, how judges are assigned to various <coughs> civil assignments. There's a recommendation that cases are triaged into complex, streamlined, and something in the middle called general. And complex cases should be assigned to a judge or judges, just like streamlined, should be assigned to certain judges. And it sets forth criteria that court administrators and chief judges should use in determining who, which judge sits in the various assignments. And experience with certain kinds of litigation, um, management capacities are all recommended as model criteria that chief judges should use. So I'm just hitting the highlights. I have a hard copy of the executive summary here. But if you want to dig into it, and this is, this is a top priority for st the state chief justices. You go to ncsc.org forward slash civil, and the whole, the research is there, the recommendations are there. I commend it to all of you. Yeah, but I read it, and it doesn't talk much about jury trials, does it? Well, it it's the whole book of business. It's the whole book of business. And yeah, small claims usually don't have juries. The judges want to focus on management, not on trying cases and how to more effectively and efficiently try cases, which is where I think the attention of trial lawyers should be, not on how to micromanage them more and more. I mean, that's why we don't have any trials, because they manage them to death. <laughs> and they make it so expensive in their management that no one can afford to get through all the screens to finally get only the creme de la creme get tried. 
Steve, so I commend to you and others Appendix J, Trial Management. Appendix J. I want to thank our panelists for being here. Thank you all for coming. This is a